Welcome to the Vitamin P Coaching Podcast. Welcome back. If you've listened before, you're very welcome if it's your first time, and I'm really glad that you're listening. I hope you've had a good week. I wish you a great weekend ahead. And again, just the thanks for listening. Um, this is me documenting some of what I'm learning, some of what I'm um, trying to make sense of, some of what I'm trying to build into my coaching practice. I want to give you like an inside the heart uh, view of some of the things that are happening as they're happening as well. So, and I'm again a little bit sniffly today, and I realize this is a recurring thing that's happened. And I've said a few times in this podcast, and I need to do something a little bit differently. I think it's just a tiredness where my nose runs more when I'm tired. And I wonder, is it an invitation to slow down and to look after myself? And nap a little bit more because it's been a busy week. I've done a couple of speaking gigs. I've done a couple of podcasts. I've done a couple of in-person talks. Uh, I was in a tech company in Belfast. They run a, or they hosted Belfast JS. So JS is JavaScript, a group of uh, roughly 25, maybe 30 people. And I spoke about, (laughs) about physiology and how some simple things that you can do to look after your physiology so that you can actually perform and solve bigger problems, which again, technology can be a, a useful part of the answering those questions that you ask or the problems, the solutions to the problems that you, you create or you want to pay attention to solving. And one of the things that I got from that is just there's a power and a value of being in the room with the people. Um, new conversations, uh, new opportunities, new possibilities will come from the people that you know, not from uh, like 14 Instagram or LinkedIn posts. And I had that kind of reaffirmed in multiple conversations this week. Somewhere I've been in the room, somewhere I've been uh connected with somebody literally had coffee with somebody yesterday and they were like oh i could get you into that room no issue uh and they'll get me a like you have to pay for membership to a certain kind of community of people and they're like i'll get you a discount another person that i met with just helped smooth the path to success so again it just comes back to who's in your network and how are they setting you up to become the type of person that you want to become and to do the work that you want to become And you may need to filter. You may need to be more discerning in who you spend time with, how you spend time with them. And the communities of people that you want to work towards, uh, like living into or becoming becoming the version of you that needs to be uh, true for you to then feel absolutely congruent in that room. You may not feel absolutely congruent, but you can definitely grow into it and stretch into it. So that's roughly where I'm at this week. Some of these things that I'm going to talk through uh, are based on uh, just things that have come up in coaching conversations, but also some just from the Waking Up app that I mentioned Sam Harris has. Uh, I really believe in some of the stuff that comes up in that, and it's it's interesting for me and my development as well. Uh, some is also based on uh, the supervision course that I'm doing. So I'm literally just off it because I'm recording this today. Uh, Sometimes I pre-record these just because of my calendar, but today I actually have an opportunity to record it after the supervision course this morning. It's on every Friday morning. So first invitation to you comes from that Sam Harris app, and it's a look the wrong way. And there was a series in it, and I can't remember what it was called, but he talked about how can you look a little longer at the things that you're not meant to look at. So for example, go to a park and study the trees, looking a little bit more slowly, taking it in and noticing how when you keep looking, you notice other details that you might have missed before. And that ability to sustain attention on a single point creates creativity. And when you look repeatedly, so for example, this person went to an art museum and only went let's give it a frequency, went weekly and only looked at the same two paintings. And because they were revisiting one thing, they saw it differently, which changed their impression of that picture, 
but also their relationship with it. So if you think about it, you are, what is it, uh, the old fable, you are not, the same person doesn't step in the same river twice because it's not the same river and you're not the same person. So when you spend time looking at art and you go and you've had a different week in between each of those uh, observations of art, so let's say it's every Friday. Let's say this podcast, you're not the same version of you that listened to last week's podcast. So you, your impression of this podcast, your relationship with, let's say it's me through the medium of audio, uh, is different. And different than it was last week, different because you're different and I'm different. So we revisit the same thing and we see it differently. And what, again, the invitation is creativity starts with attention and what do other people overlook? This is an original point of view. And if you see beyond what others want you to see, you might be astonished and then you can tell people about it. So you just deepen the relationship you have with the space around you. And I had this kind of realization a couple of weeks ago when I was out cycling on my mountain bike and I have a Garmin on the, on the handlebar and I was roughly doing 30 K an hour along one of the trails. And I just realized two squirrels caught my eye on the left of the path. And I realized because I was focused on my speed, I was missing out on the detail. And if I was doing 30K an hour, just imagine I slowed down to 22 or 23 kilometers an hour. The detail I was able to take in, the texture and the kind of definition of what I was able to pay attention to was beautiful in comparison to hurtling through the same trail. And the invitation again is how much you slow down look at the same things with a new kind of self so that they become different with your observation because you will be different and it would be different in response to that. That's like the first invitation. So um, maybe let me make a tactical, test that out. Go visit the same park, the same walk, the same museum, the same coffee shop, the same whatever it is. And commit to doing it once a week for a month. Just see what you notice differently every time you do. You can also do this with kids or with your dog or with, I'm going to try it with Katie. Just observe a little bit longer. Just notice details that you hadn't noticed before. They're changing. You're changing. Just see what you notice. I met, I was coaching somebody yesterday in a coffee shop in Belfast. And before this person arrived, I ordered a coffee. And the guy serving me, gent, like gentleman, I've seen him a few times, I always say hello. I said to him, how are you doing? And he said, I'm stressed. And then he changed his mind. He's like, no, no, I'm fine. And I said, it's okay if you're stressed. You can tell me that. And <laughs> one of the things that I'm becoming more comfortable with, and I'm hoping to give people again, who spend time with me, the invitation is you don't have to change how you feel with me, but you also don't have to change how you feel with yourself. Or, I mean, we judge feelings too quick. We judge ourselves for feeling feelings that we feel we shouldn't have too quick, too often. And so when you're feeling things like anger or lost or frustration, or stress, or overwhelm, or pressure, or any of those kind of things that you're told you're bad, sad, depressed, down, I said lost. Um, it's okay to feel them. Typically why they hang around, why they feel heavier is because we've resisted them and we've pushed them away because we don't want to feel them. I had a really heavy Tuesday because I just was met with resistance. I just met resistance that I was feeling. And it's just because I'm changing. <laughs> so it's just a part of the process. And I think, yeah, we judge it too quick, too early. We try to move through or beyond it. We distract ourselves with the phone or we eat something or I had a bar of chocolate that day. Uh, 
one of the sharing ones. Turn off for sharing. And yeah, how might you give yourself permission to feel what you feel? And rather than judging it as bad, if it's an emotion that you're conditioned to think is bad, you just get curious about it. Like, why am I feeling resistance right now? I got to the realization it was because I'm growing. Um, I'm transforming, I'm changing. So what can I let go of? How can, might I use this opportunity to let go of and leave behind some stuff? So it was a helpful emotion to recognize and to allow rather than resist. And I wonder how you might do the same for yourself. Another conversation I had with somebody, and I wrote this down before the conversation, not knowing it was going to come up in the conversation. It's ha that's happened a few times this week. Um, is that your ability to handle strain or pressure is directly related to your recovery. So your capacity to handle stress is related to how much kind of parasympathetic activity you can demonstrate. Or, sorry, not demonstrate. That sounds performative. How much parasympathetic activity you kind of do <laughs> uh, for yourself. Um, so how might you recover better? How might you recover more? How might that be part of what you do and how you are in your week? Because that will help you uh, decompress, handle the stress, not get overwhelmed, not get lost in the chaos. Because when you do, when you do not recover, you will burn out, you lose hope, you may lose confidence, so self doubt and resistance will present itself. And you'll retreat to a safe version of yourself from the past. So schedule that it will not show up. And we often think rest or recovery has to be going from one on to zero off. It's not. It's to find the low stakes flow state type activity. So something that distracts you enough to keep your attention, but that's low stakes. So for example, lowering the expectations of what it must give you. It's not to make you productive. It's to do it for the sake of doing it. It's not to have an outcome from it. It's literally just to allow your brain and body to relax and maybe express itself like art or dancing or something like that. But it's, yeah, it's building in something like that for yourself so that you top up your confidence, so that you don't lose hope, so that you don't burn out so that you don't repeat the past, but you create and live into a new future. So how will you do that this week? How will you do that this weekend, especially over Christmas as well? There's expectations to visit everyone, be happy all the time, all that kind of stuff, all horseshit. Choose, be intentional and create space for yourself during that so that you are yourself and you're not other people and you're not bowing and what somebody said, yes, it was bending over backwards to make everybody else happy and suffering and struggling and burning out because of it. You don't need to do that. You just need to get a little bit more intentional and be okay with saying no. A The, the supervision call I was on last week, the course. So I think I'm one of 12 on the course, but I'm the only man. And... Last week was an extremely emotional call. And I had just had news about my mum. Literally while walking, or sorry, not walking, but yeah, maybe walking, like joining the Zoom. So I hadn't probably processed it enough. And then there were some people who were mourning the anniversary of one of their parents or both of their parents some people who cared for their parents, some people who are um, very closely related to some of the uh, war going on at the moment in the world. And I guess I just hadn't seen or experienced heightened emotion and then had to explain how I was feeling. 
and it was difficult and I've, I sobbed in front of the group. <laughs> I got really upset. Not really upset, but I definitely was emotional. And I think, again, it's back to like feel what you feel. That was what I felt. But the invitation that I took from the call was, I mean, the natural order of things is that your parents will, will die before you do. And my both my parents are alive. But I know that I will go through the experience of losing both of them. And I heard other people on the call who had lost parents, so they were further up that path. And I think it's just an invitation or a reminder to consider how you want to lose them because you will. And I don't think we think about it until it happens or it's happened. But what if you could think about it ahead of time and be intentional again about this rather than uh, suffer in reactivity? This next one is, um, so I'm going to a new therapist. He only works with men and he looks at masculine archetypes. So archetypes are these kind of unconscious uh, frames or I think the word is just like 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 uh, kind of consistent uh, maybe narrative parts of us so for example there's four main ones king warrior magician lover and there's plus or minus each of those. So when we underplay king, when we overplay king, when we underplay magician, when we overplay magician, for example. So king is that kind of congruent, authentic self, uh, like higher order version of you. Uh, you can imagine this as kind of speaking from heart. And we can overplay that and feel arrogant or not even feel it, but like come across as arrogant or we can underplay it and crumble as a king. And this will play out for women as well. There'll be a female version of this that probably is directly related. But what I see from people who, let's say it's speak in public, we shy away from confidence or, for example, for me, standing in king because we don't want to be arrogant. So we typically will live more in crumbling king because we don't want to go to arrogant king. But what that means is that you miss out on that middle part, the possibility of being who you are at your like truest, most congruent, kind of highest self. And so we, you lose that, but so do we. And so I wonder if we let go of, or just built an understanding of who we are when we're arrogant and who we are when we're in that kind of king, kind of middle state or space, so that we can live in it a little bit more because often we don't have the articulation of it. We know what we don't want really clearly. Don't want to be doubting or insecure or afraid or whatever, but we forget to narrow in on who we do want to be. And that might just be a useful invitation today. What do you want? Who do you want to be? Who do you choose to be? Get clear on that. And then that will help you looking forward, becoming and being that version of yourself. Because otherwise we just lose, you lose your potential and we lose your potential. Another conversation I had this week was focused on somebody who's uh, running their own business, but moving through life, just doing and ticking boxes and ticking boxes and they're l literally experiencing what they dreamed of years ago. And so the invitation is to, to this person was, how might you slow down a little bit? Again, like the bike, the mountain bike and seeing the squirrels, how might you slow down just a little bit so that you can actually experience the moment in front of you? And the way I make sense of this is that your potential is not in what you do, but how you show up in the moment in front of you and how much of that moment you can take in. So again, when you're hurtling down the trail 
on a mountain bike at speed, you cannot take in as much detail. You just can't. It's literally impossible. But when you slow down to the speed of life, really good book, uh, slowing down to the speed of life, you soak in more, you experience more, and more of your potential in the moment, I think, comes out. So how might you let go of the need for speed? And how might you live and experience the moment in front of you a little bit more? This probably counteracts it, but it actually, I think it's additive to what I've just said rather than taken away from it. But another one of my coaching clients this week shared their uh, 10x goals for next year, 2024. So they had written goals that they wanted to aim for and they were reading a book. They actually read, the, I think it's 10x Mentor by Grant Cardone. And I had recommended uh, 10x is easier than 2x by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. And the 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 concept is the same. If you aim for 10x, your brain has got to come up with different solutions. And there's a quote by Les Brown, and he says, uh, "Most of the time, sorry, the the problem is not that we aim too low. Sorry, too high and miss." It's that we aim too low and hit. And how might you 10x what you're aiming for? And the reason I ask that is because when you ask, you might just get. And I think it's normal and natural to aim small, which is safe and certain. But there's so much space when you aim 10x to let go of and transform towards becoming the version of self that achieves that 10x vision. And even if you miss, it's definitely going to be more than 2x where you are. So how might you get braver and bolder and more courageous? And the reason I'm writing this and kind of saying this out loud is because I'm taking this as an invitation to myself. Some of the people that I'm working with, some of the people that I hope to work with are <laughs> just incredible and I want to be better for them so I need to think big and I need to I, like I want to impact more people there's more people out there that are lost and stuck and wanting more and better than where they are and I absolutely believe in my bones that I can do something about it so I need to think bigger and that invites other people to think bigger within that as well so what might you ask for because you just might get it. 10x is easier than 2x. Another coaching client, and I think it's just such a useful frame, shared that they were at a networking thing recently and had seen somebody at the networking thing previously uh, online and had made a judgment and met the person and realized they're human that they had the same issues, the same challenges, the same good and bad in their life as this person that I've been working with. And so it's easy to see people as perfect online, as a certain caricature of the version of them that they are. And we often think we have to portray that caricature. And then when we realize actually our life is the yin-yang symbol, it contains good and bad, it contains bright and dark, it contains the things we want and some of the things we don't you're more easily accepting of yourself, but you're also more easily accepting of other people who are also contain both. So how might you accept that for yourself? And how might you give other people that same level of just kind of human acceptance that we're messy and that that's okay? Another coaching conversation this week we talked about alchemy and how alchemy is taken lead and turning it into gold and sometimes we've all had lead heavy dark experiences and i think we forget our capability to be alchemists and to transform those and transform ourselves because of what we've been through like you are the alchemist and you are the uh, alchemical gold because some of that will come from 
shifting your thinking from or to and. So for example, you can do good and have a positive impact and you can make money. And so how might you develop yourself? How might you evolve the stories you tell about your past so that you can positively impact more people? Because that's a good thing and it's possible. So maybe you're already the alchemist and maybe you have an opportunity to um, do, do, do alchemy. It, this kind of links back to the 10x piece around asking for what you want, but it's always linking to who you know. And so what I wrote here is, so put yourself in the room, ask, ask for the connection, ask for introductions. And if you don't ask, you don't get into those conversations and they are happening anyway. You're just not even in the room. And it's easier than I thought to get into the room with some of these people. I've a audience that I want to speak with next year. I have some big talks that I want to do. I'm going to ask because that's what I want. And I think I have stuff to bring and give and I have an open heart and more to give. So yeah, just wanted to share that. Who might you want in your network that you want to work with or you want to build connection with or you want to whatever, like whatever it is. I mean, one individual yesterday literally can connect me with 70 CEOs. <laughs> one conversation. It's all it takes. This next one is linked back to feeling what you feel. And I just wrote, I sat in resistance this week. I know it's from growth, but it did not make it a pleasant experience. It felt heavy. It felt dark. And I had the thought that I wanted to pretend that everything was okay. And instead, what I did is I told the truth about feeling stuck. And that actually helped cut through the resistance and created an opening for a new possibility. So again, sitting in resistance, being okay with resistance. Resistance will show up. It's just fear in different expressions, anger, frustration, jealousy, self-doubt, insecurity, lack of confidence, lack of clarity, all that kind of stuff. Just sit with it. Tell the truth about it. Feel it. And it might just create an opening for possibility. It might just channel uh, through the emotion, not around it. And I think healing will happen there. One of the things that came from last week's supervision call as well is just around kind of metaphor, story, bringing in tools or resources, or in this example, it's poetry and quotes to some of the coaching conversations. So I've been collecting poems and collecting stories and quotes since, but I'm also going to uh, just, I'm actually going to try and write more poetry from a from my heart uh, but I'm also just let me repeat some of them to you that I've heard recently that I just love so I've talked about David White before White with a Y uh, he's a Welsh poet his book uh, Crossing the Unknown Sea Work as a Pilgrimage of Identity is beautiful and this poem is beautiful and I got sent it on my roughly last day of city uh, by a friend of mine who's extremely profound and it's called everything is waiting for you so everything is waiting for you by David White your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone as if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely, even you, at times, have felt the grand array, the swelling presence and the chorus crowding out your solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you or the window latch grants you freedom. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. 
put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything, everything, everything is waiting for you. So there's, I think, two lines in it I don't really get, but the rest of it, I'm like, oh my lord, that's unbelievable. <laughs> it's just beautiful. So just wanted to share that. Anything that David White writes is profound and very deep, but definitely full of development. I was in a triad as part of my supervision course, and one of the, so I was being, uh, I think I was being supervised and I got asked the question, what is the story of your heart versus your head? So I'm very good at speaking from my head, which is the magician in those archetypes I talked about before. But from my heart, which is my king, it, I find it harder. And one of the, <laughs> one of the sentences or kind of, let's call it a poem. I don't know what makes it a poem. Let's just pretend it's three sentences that I, chose that that i asked my heart to express was my heart aches to express itself not in the package the world demands but the gentle whisper of encouragement to someone at the edge of giving up so my heart aches to express itself not in the package the world demands but the gentle whisper of encouragement to someone at the edge of giving up I'm like, that's fucking cool. <laughs> Heart, please speak more often. Um, so that's what I've been tuning into. And this person that asked me that question told me, just put my hand on my heart every day and ask my heart different questions. Like, what do you want to say to me? What is your story? All that kind of stuff. And it just sounds woo-woo, but it's so far as being profound for me. And I'm going to keep doing it as a daily practice. Um, I actually try and do it sometimes when I'm trying to fall asleep. It's just a lovely little thing to do. Um, one of them, uh, one of the people in that triad and in the conversation around um, uh, bringing things to coaching conversations like stories or metaphors or quotes or poems or whatever, they recommended somebody called Jaya John. So it's J-A-I-Y-A, John, J-O-H-N. And I just have a couple of, this person's quotes from it seems like a book or maybe a collection called daughter drink this water so one of them is if you see someone who has good light thank them it will help them keep the light on love it like next one dear soul do not wait for others to celebrate you you are alive that is the celebration next one the way the sun feels on your skin after a cold night. Arrive like that to every soul. Next one. Spend your life loving, not seeking love. Ocean. Need not seek water. And then this last one from Jaya John. It was always you. You were the library where you should lose yourself, the book you should read, the language you should learn, the place you should voyage, the discovery you should make. All the world's wonder is a song, and the notes and the singer are you. And on that note, thank you for listening. I wish you a great weekend. I think I'll be able to do one next week, which is the 25, 24, 23, 22, 22nd of December. But if not, and you don't hear it, I wish you as happy a Christmas as you can have. I wish, again, emotional. I wish your loved ones your presence 
with a lightness and a wholeness of heart. And I hope you give yourself a little bit more credit for how far you've come and how much more you have to give. Uh, much love. Speak soon. And uh, see you in the new year as well.